Okay, can we call the meeting to order then? I think we have everyone here. We certainly have a quorum. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that today's meeting is held on the traditional territory of the Saanich people. Uh, and would like to then, moving us right along uh, to the agenda. Um, any comments, anything anyone would like to add? We'll move approval. Second. All happy with that? It's all approved? I see a lot of nods, sort of. Perfect. Okay, then we're done with the agenda. Okay, adoption of the minutes from the last meeting. Um, any questions, any comments on the minutes? Move adoption of minutes. Sarah's moving to adopt the minutes. Second. Did you get all that, Tara? <laughs> Just want to make sure. It's always so hard sometimes. Okay, um, all in favor of adopting the minutes? Excellent. Okay. So actually the next thing on the agenda is actually the presentation from Mike. Uh, he hasn't joined us quite yet, eh? No, he has no. not yet. Okay. Yesterday, I know we told him that it was at two o'clock. Mm -hmm. Just while we're waiting then, Jen, because um, it's hard to jump ahead because of course, if he's on in the next two minutes, then we get what well, we could, but um, Rob, maybe I can uh, uh, add an update on the minutes uh, we recorded last time that um, I would look into whether I could get a wave rider buoy uh, to do a little instrumentation for us. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, Randy, or someone's kindly suggested we could get the mayor to write a letter for me. Uh, but I chose to take a um, non, uh, a, a bottom up approach, <laughs> let's say. <laughs> Um, which was to canvas uh, the Fisheries and Oceans uh, Ocean Science Group to see if any instruments were available, basically. And um, unfortunately, I drew a blank. Uh, they don't have any instruments in available. In fact, it seems they rarely wa measure wave regime these days, which was a surprise to me, to be honest. Um, so I didn't have any luck. Sorry to report that. Does that mean, and Scott, do you think that they... Is it a lack of instrumentation available right now, or there just isn't any? Now? Uh, there are a few instruments, but they're uh, they're in the Arctic and deployed uh, around in various locations, so they're just not available. But in general, there I, I kind of expected there would be a, a number of instruments, but there there's only a couple. Okay. At the uh, Sydney Breakfast Club meeting next week, uh, I can mention it that uh, if any of the uh, the local companies have got a wave rider that isn't currently in use. Um, there would be uh, an opportunity to uh, deploy it for this. Sounds great. Yeah, SNC Lavalin made it pretty clear that they would love to get a winter's worth of real live data for our site. So if we can find it somehow, that would be that would be great. We is could. there um is there something uh, alternate that the town should be looking at installing at this point um, for for this winter? I mean the, the wave height's the most critical thing. Um, I mean you can put a weather station there, but of course you're not that far from the airport. I don't know how much value that has on its own. Would you agree, I Scott? Think, it sounds I like the John, wave height's uh, critical. John was suggesting if they could just get one significant storm event that they could measure with winds and wind direction and waves that would be enough to improve his modeling. Um, but I think that's a good idea to maybe just talk it up at the breakfast meeting and see where we get. Maybe we can update. We could turn to UVic and see if there's an instrument there or I could reach wider. Um, but at this moment, maybe how about we pause for a little bit and get an update uh, on that breakfast lunch meeting. It occurs to me that um, it's worthwhile mentioning it to the uh, Shaw uh, Center for the Salish Sea. They've got a lot of contacts. 
Mike, Mike mentioned, um, Cronquist mentioned uh, the um, wave inundation study that was done, or they had commissioned several years ago, and uh, um, I think indicated that he had provided that maybe to our engineers or was, it, was going to. Is the idea that that's maybe um, outdated or not quite the same thing, or um, this would just simply um, sort of confirm or augment that? Um, I think, Randy, the, um, the question is whether they used available data or whether they collected some additional data that uh, iOS maybe doesn't know about. Okay. Yeah. But I, I would sure. suspect they may have uh, simply gone with uh, available data. Right. Sorry, Fanny, when you say they, do you mean um, SNC or do you mean? The people that the marker group used. used. Several years ago. Right. I don't know who the consultant was for that. Yeah. Yeah. John alluded to some uncertainties, I think, as well, when he spoke to us uh, last time. And I thought what he was getting at is the the general study is kind of a regional study, whereas, you know, the unique conditions right around our particular facility are deserving of sort of reflection within the regional context, in which case I think that's what drew him to to the possibility of doing some instrumentation uh, just to be able to get a, a footprint on our regional or our site specific case versus the regional perspective. I think that was generally what I got out of that. Well, and also that um, the, um, the North Sand, the district of North Sandwich work that they did is they're technically of course, isn't specific to the site because it's Sydney. So they were extrapolating that slightly, as opposed to having specific data for that exact location. I can see that having even a bit of data would let them know whether their extrapolation is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. I and mean, like I said, one, as uh, Scott's saying, even one really or two really good storm events helps them validate exactly what kind of true overall wave height they're talking about between storm surge wind, direction, everything, right? In that specific spot. Jan, do you think it's possible that Mike thinks it's 2.30? No, he, he called me and he uh, he said he would be a couple minutes late. So oh. I, I don't know if we uh, do want to move and talk about uh, the next item until he, he gets on. Well, we could start. The next item was the, um, the action plan which is the, I guess you want to, do you want to start on that? Because it's the big Excel spreadsheet basically that you sent, right? Sure, or if anyone else has any general um, Q and A at this point, um, maybe anything that's come up since last meeting, potentially, or is there? Maybe, uh, Jen, I'll just comment and, and probably as much for Rob and Scott who have some expertise in this area. Um, I, I know we chatted uh, previously about the, the, the concept of the floating structure and SNC. Um, I know couldn't think of any anything uh, to to be directly relatable, uh, and I don't know that this is either. But if you're not familiar with the uh, new arrangement that C-SPAN made off of uh, their facility at Schwartz Bay they have um, permanently moored um, using pilings, perhaps, uh, you know, chains to anchors as well. I don't know a floating um, structure in which they have people working uh, daily as well as vehicles on daily. And so they kind of ran out of real estate is what's happened there. And they're using it as sort of overflow for tractor trailer uh, parking, vehicle parking. Um, and of course, staff are on and off moving things on and off the C-SPAN ferry. It struck me um, as, as a different application, certainly, uh, arguably in a more protected location. But I think we've all seen uh, northern uh, gales, uh, particularly northeastern gales that come in there and, and vessels up on the shore there. So it certainly does get a fair amount of, uh, of wave action in there, um, not as regularly as we would see here in Sydney. Uh, but I mentioned it in the event either of you have noted it um, and maybe just wanna see it uh, for reference, uh, somewhat different, but again, maintaining uh, vehicular traffic on a daily basis, um, similar perhaps to what a floating bridge structure might be expected to accommodate. So just wanna throw that out there in case uh, anyone is familiar with it or, or hasn't seen it for that matter. 
And uh, I guess I can also add uh, that um, SNC did go out and review the pontoon on Friday. So I haven't uh, received any feedback from that, but they've done their on-site inspection and um, are moving forward with the, uh, the analysis. They're working on a, a memo for us with respect to buildings on, on the structure. So uh, we're really just um, waiting for information from them for this. And then I guess we're going to also hear Mike's on his presentation too, of course, this man if he gets on here. Uh, just a question, Jen, because you sent out, okay, the, the spreadsheet you actually sent out with the action plan, was your, your intent to walk through a little bit of that or is this more for information? Um, I guess the idea is to, you know, make sure that everyone agrees with this sort of plan and then we could go back and um, update the Gantt chart based on, on the plan. This is more of a granular look at what actually needs to be answered from the last, the last meeting. Um, there was talk about having actionable items. So that's the intent of this, um, this action plan. Um, so to agree on, you know, the general, general idea and the, the items that are on it, or if there are any additional items that need to be added to it, um, we can do that in future meetings too, but this is to, to get a first, uh, first shot at okay. it. <laughs> and, th and, this, and this is really right out of the approach report document. I mean, it's mm -hmm. right. What you've done is taken all of those items and you've basically said, do we or don't we action it? And then tried to put down when. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in theory, there's nothing, I mean, given that, we, given that we've said the general approach report listed all of the kinds of things that we need to do. Yeah, so if anything, if we want to look at the, the what column here, um, we could discuss some of those items. But yeah, most of this, this information is from uh, the approach report. Right. Oh, here's, uh, here's Mike. I'll just let him in here. Okay, good. We can come back to this one. Okay. Hi, Mike. Uh, you're muted, Mike. I'm unmuted. Good afternoon. Uh, not hearing you, Mike. Can you hear me now? If you could, your very, volume is pretty quiet. quiet. Mm. If you could just maybe get a little closer to your microphone. Uh, it should be okay. How about that? Nope. It's still very quiet. I'm just going to rejoin and try something different. One sec here. Okay. Sarah, you have the most beautiful background of all of us. <laughs> it's concealing the most chaos behind. <laughs> Where is that, by the way? Uh, it's uh, just uh, around the corner from Rest Haven Island. Where's your cat? Uh, that's the chaos I speak of. <laughs> they're they're uh -huh. everywhere. They're kittens, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Mike, you're uh, back in now, but still muted right now. Can you hear me now? Pretty you're much pretty the quiet. same. Hmm. Not sure what the issue is. I'm gonna turn my volume up here somehow. Is that any better? Marginally. Well, yeah, Martin, it was a little better. How about now? That's, yeah. that's okay. Okay. I, these phones are getting in my way here. So Mike, just to uh, remind you that this, this meeting is being recorded, but uh, you now have the floor. 
All right, well, thanks everybody. I am going to um, share. Your screen. Start from the beginning. Okay, we did a dry run and and um, ran through the presentation. It's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a long story, probably longer than you might imagine in terms of of the pontoons. But I think it's necessary to give you a good background as to how we came about owning these bridge pontoons and how useful they've been in the variety of projects that they have been involved with, uh, involved in over a, a, over a long period of time. Um, the intent and my hope is that you'll see that, uh, you know, it sounds like used bridge pontoons is something that might be a bit daunting for people to consider, but um, I hope that uh, by the end of my presentation, you'll appreciate that these are very substantial, useful pieces of marine infrastructure. Um, these are, this is the last pontoon section that we have for sale. You'll see that we've sold them all around the world to a bunch of um, kind of smart uh, people that, that use them in very substantial projects. And so my hope is that you'll just get a snapshot of you know, what the, the versatility and the value of these pontoons would be um, as they pertain to the Sydney waterfront. Um, for the, those of you who don't know me or us, uh, I am uh, Vice President of Business Development. I was Seagate Pontoons. We're a Sydney BC based company. We're part of Marker Group. Uh, Marker Group is related to uh, the Sydney Pier Hotel and Sydney Park with City Waterfront Partnership. And I'm VP Business Development for Seagate Pontoon. Uh, the Hood Canal Floating Bridge. Some of you may be familiar with the Hood Canal Floating Bridge. It is the primary connection between the Olympic Peninsula and Interstate 5 or the I-5. Uh, so to give you some reference, here's Sydney, Victoria, Los Angeles, where you take the Black Ball Ferry, uh, Seattle, um, and the Hood Canal floating bridge. So if you were to take the Black Ball over to Port Angeles and drive to Seattle, you're likely going to go across the Hood Canal floating bridge. Uh, it is, the, as I mentioned, the primary connection between the Olympic Peninsula and Interstate 5. It is the, I'm pretty sure this is still the case. It's the third longest floating bridge in the world and the longest over uh, salt body water, almost two kilometers long. Important to note, it was designed by the US Army Corps of Engineers to carry a highway. So, you know, the, again, these pontoons are very substantial and they had a very high design spec. Um, on a typical day, they'd carry between 16,000 to 20,000 vehicles and 19,000 trucks. Um, unfortunately, uh, the bridge was built in around 1960 and 1979, there was a kind of a catastrophic event, a perfect storm where a large storm hit the bridge. Uh, there was what I understand was operator error. The, the pontoons are like big hollow casings. So they, uh, you know, they have um, a large interior. And I guess when this storm hit, um, there were some hatch covers uh, on the pontoon uh, that contained pontoon coverage that were left open and a massive storm hit it and the west side actually sunk. Uh, turned into the replacement of the west side, which took place in 1981 or thereabouts. Um, what happened was that the original design of the bridge had, um, you know, the pontoons were made of high PSI, very strong concrete. The superstructure, which is the highway component and all the columns that made up the superstructure was made of a lighter weight concrete, had a pumicey kind of aggregate. And it, it uh, over a period of time, absorbed seawater. And so the superstructure of the east half just ended, uh, came to the end of its usable life. And so that bridge section was uh, replaced, or that east half, half was replaced uh, in a replacement project that took place between 2003 to 2010. Um, the number that's been thrown around is the, the value of that replacement project is a half a billion dollars US. So that's what it costs to, to replace the pontoons that we in fact took. So in 
Yeah, 20, that's a bit of a typo. In 2009, Seagate pontoons took possession of the east half, uh, the entirety of the east half of the Hood Canal floating bridge, approximately 900 meters in length. And when you uh, line the pontoons end to end, so almost a kilometer of floating bridge. Um, we transported them up uh, via tug in various sections. So the M and W, M section, the NOP section, QR section, and it was actually the STU section were all towed up to British Columbia. Here's some photos of the towing as it took place. Um, you might have uh, been quite startled if you if you were out boating that day and you saw big sections of a of a suspended freeway come floating by. Um, but that's in fact what happened. We we towed up the pontoons. Um, eventually, they ended up uh, the Fraser River, and when they got there, we took the superstructure off. So you can see that. The superstructure was um, comprised of uh, a deck that had a highway on top of it. it, was full with traffic signs and light standards and everything that came with a highway. Um, and you can see that it was quite an undertaking to take the superstructure off, but what it left was uh, these floating pon concrete pontoons that became very usable. Here is the NLP section. So you can see on the left-hand side, this was the bridge while it was in operation. And the right-hand side, this is the bridge after the superstructure was taken off. So I'm actually, I actually took this photo from the control tower. And uh, so this is the exact same location um, where the photo is taken each time, uh, one just with the superstructure on and one with the superstructure removed. So you might be asking yourself, what would possess somebody to acquire uh, a kilometer, almost a kilometer long of a used floating bridge? The answer to that is it's very valuable marine infrastructure. Um, we originally acquired the bridge pontoons um, to, uh, for with the intent of a proposal for the Sydney waterfront. And um, Councillor Wainwright maybe, maybe recall some of this uh, from back in the day. Um, yeah, we, we propose to have a feature pier and a, and a protected harbor uh, for a marina. Um, this is actually, a, this is a bit of a blast from the past. This is the old Beacon Park um, with the old bandstand in it before we, we did develop the hotel. Um, we actually added about, I think it was about 15,000 square feet to the park through the construction of the hotel. Uh, but what she, well, you'll see superimposed is a large marina. So we actually did a, um, you know, some, some images of what it might look like to have uh, the pontoons and a marina in front of uh, the state waterfront. The thing to note here is just the height of the pontoons off the water, and we'll get into that a little bit further, but um, it's really one of the benefits of a floating structure is it rises and falls with the sea. Fortunately, this was not successful. Uh, we actually um, went through a period of proposal, but uh, after after we uh, we ran through the proposal with the with Sydney Waterfront uh, partnership and the town of Sydney, we moved on to sell uh, the pontoons to various places around the world. So this is the actual M and Double M pontoon section. It was towed up and re um, refurbished and made into a cruise terminal. It's actually a very busy cruise terminal prior to COVID hitting, and it, they used it for a commercial loading facility as well. This was a private entity that bought, that bought this pontoon and, uh, and refurbished it and repurposed it. Uh, one of the kind of really, I think, quite analogous to what might happen in Sydney is um, what we did with Port Alberni. This was the Port Alberni Port Authority. Um, this was the TU pond. Again, it was refurbished, towed up and, and placed, and it's become something that's a real, a real feature and focus of the waterfront in Port Alberni. Um, you can see here, you know, the, the, the height or the freeboard of the pontoons is somewhere in the range of six feet above water. So they did bring in some uh, small float and finger floats and ramp down to that to have access to the water for some of the smaller marge boats that you might see. Um, as you can see, it turned into a really wonderful project uh, for uh, the town of Port Alberni and a feature of the waterfront. Uh, kind of one of the more interesting um, projects was the QRS pontoons. Each one of these pontoons uh, was 360 feet long, 50 feet wide, and about a neighborhood of 14 to 15 feet in depth. Um, 
these three pontoons were sold to an, again a private entity. They were they were refurbished and repurposed and put on dockwise ship and went to Melville Island, Australia. And they they were repurposed into a big um, commercial industrial loading facility off there. It's this is north of Darwin. It's kind of really in a really remote place. Um, there's a uh, acacia plantation on this island, and it's turned into a, a uh, like a fueling facility um, up in the north part of Australia. Uh, the, the final sections that we have sold were to Schools Marina in Horseshoe Bay. Um, Schools had another pontoon that um, that sunk on them, and so they actually bought the. OP portion of the NOP section and repurpose that into a, a big breakwater. That's the primary purpose of this pontoon section is as a breakwater. Um, of course, it has a very significant amount of deck uh, that is useful, useful. And you can see at the open end, there's uh, a, a protected harbor that's useful as well. So the pontoon that's remaining in the final pontoon is the end pontoon. Um, the end pontoon, is is a little bit more uh, difficult to envision or understand. Um, and I'll try to give you a little bit more information. So this was the pontoon that was at the very um, uh, furthest part from shore on the east side. Um, it, it contains, uh, it was part of the NOP section which had a protected harbor where the M and double M pontoon moved in and out. And this created a draw span to open and close the bridge for either um, vehicular traffic or for marine traffic. So you can see when the draw span is closed, the M and double M pontoon is out of the bay of NOP and it's connected to the west side of the bridge. Uh, when it's open, uh, the draw span M and double N was pulled into the protected bay and created an opening in the bridge. And this is actually a nuclear submarine. There's a nuclear submarine station up at the far end of Hood Canal. So this is a nuclear submarine traffic stopped and, uh, and the submarine is moving through the, uh, the, the draw span. This just gives you some more images of the NLP section. So again, we have the protected bay and this is the M and double M pontoon section. And again, looking at uh, the superstructure that was removed off the NLP section. So, gives you a, a sense of scale. There's a fellow in a red uh, safety vest that's standing to on the left-hand side of the pontoon as we're looking at it. And this pontoon section in its entirety was 930 feet long. Um, a BC ferry, I believe, is in the 600, mid 600s. So this is uh, the, the length of a BC ferry and 50% more again. Again, the, uh, the OP section was purchased by Sewell's Marine and it actually cut off the end section uh, or the end pontoon prior to it being sold to Sewell's. And so you can see um, the end, which I've demonstrated in a line drawn in the top right there has been cut off the end of the OP section. Gives you a bit of a, a plan view in the graphic. Um, the dimensions of this end section are 266, almost 267 feet long. 102 feet wide. It's got an inner bay that's 55 feet. And it has six underwater struts. And this is the thing that's quite interesting about it is that these two uh, 23 foot wide section or pontoons are connected by a struts underneath the water. Um, you can see kind of the water is clear enough uh, at Sewell's at Horseshoe Bay that you can actually see the struts underwater there. And that's what connects the sides of this pontoon section. Uh, it's presently located uh, right, uh, just a little bit further up uh, northeast, I guess it is, past um, the Newport Man on the Pitt River. Um, this is a picture of, um, actually from Google Earth, uh, of the NOP section, and this is what's remaining of the end section. Um, I take you back to one of our towing photographs. Although this, the end section has been flipped around, it still gives you a good representation. You can see the superstructure um, of the of the NOP section has been removed. Uh, we've actually cut the end section off, but it gives you a, a, a real before and after sense. Yes, this is where where I took those photographs, looking at the bridge uh, to the east, that the uh, the control tower is where I was taking it from, that you see on the left hand side, and I was looking looking up the length of the uh, of the highway at that point in time. So that's gone and recycled. And um, we have this pontoon section now 
103 feet wide, uh, 23 feet wide of the, the, the sections that are above water, 55 foot wide uh, protected area. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, you could um, span this 55 foot section and I'll see some different images uh, what, what that be, might be useful for. These are line drawings just again to give you a sense of the pontoons themselves. You can see I've just kind of um, superimposed what the spanning would look like for the 55 foot, that would be 55 feet wide and 266 foot long span. Uh, another option is you only do a portion of it. And so you'd have, you know, say if you did half of it, you'd have a 130 foot area that's been spanned and then you'd have a protected area, let's say another 130 feet. Again, the water depth is gonna be in the neighborhood of seven feet, six, seven feet in that area. Um, so you could bring a lot of uh, boats in and out of there that would have clearance over top of those trucks. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side, uh, I've removed the, uh, the existing beacon morph and superimposed to scale uh, just a footprint of what the pontoon, the end pontoon would look like on the waterfront. I put some measurements on here just to give you a frame of reference. If you look at the, um, the very bottom right, the fishing pier, you can see it's kind of where the circular paving stones are. Um, just on, on the shore side of the fishing pier, right to the end of the fishing pier, that's 212 feet long. So that's right in the neighborhood of, of um, uh, this pontoon section uh, as in its entire length is, is about half of that length if you took of where the fishing pier is. If you take to the back side, if you're looking on the left side of my slides here, if you take the back side of the, um, of the blue uh, fish store, um, and kind of take it out to the east there, that's 124 feet, just to give you a sense of what that distance is. So it just gives you a sense of scale. So it is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it would be a substantial addition and a useful addition to the waterfront. Uh, again, uh, options as to what you might do there with the, with the decking. So you could have a full surface span and have, uh, you know, full, 100 and 203 feet wide and 266 feet long. Be very useful for moorage, you know, at, at the right times of year for pocket cruise ships, tall ships and super yacht. Um, or you can do the partial uh, where you're gonna have moorage for more transient uh, water taxis, et cetera, that would be able to come and go from the inside of the pontoon section. And again, moorage for pocket cruises, cruise ships, tall ships and super yacht. Um, you might ask, how do you how do you moor this? How do you keep it in place? This is a uh, you know it's a sketch drawing, but this is the the concept of what actually took place um, more or less at at uh, Port Alberni. So you actually have moorage lines that are chain and rope, or there's actually a rubberized moorage line that could be used, and they crisscross underneath the pontoon section, uh, mooring it in place and um, and creating the clearance that you'd need to bring the, the boats um, back and forth. You would need, uh, you know, potentially you'd have some piles on the shore end and, or there's a school of thought that you wouldn't want any piles, you'd just want moorage lines. Um, you'd have a, uh, uh, a bulkhead uh, on the shore side and then you'd have a ramp that comes down. So again, you can see something that's very analogous to that in Port Alberta. Uh, these are just some um, images Port Alberni of some of the more dockets were installed to the size of the pontoons. Again, they have some chain. There's actually a, a protective wrap that we will get here, but it's underneath the, the corner and down uh, beside the pontoon to protect it from getting damaged um, from, from the moorage lines. And here are some images that are right from the drawing um, that you can see how the 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 uh, the, the moorage lines were, were installed onto the pontoons and then wrapped underneath. So let's talk about the benefit of floating concrete pontoons. As I mentioned before, they um, rise and fall with the tide, which I think is really important in, in, relative to uh, you know, the Sydney waterfront and some of the concerns that, um, um, that we have there, both with tight lines, um, uh, this is a picture of the fishing pier. We all love the fishing pier, but you know the, the reality is the fishing pier is a view obstructor, and uh, and this is that image that I showed you originally that we superimposed um, the pontoons uh, in our uh, in our uh, um, waterfront marina proposal way back when. And you can see that 
the pontoons are going to be continually rising and falling. You, you, you can manipulate the freeboard to a certain extent, but you're going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of seven feet above the water. So there is a benefit just of, of the view corridor. Um, also, you know, we all, we all have concerns and it's a, it's a very topical issue is what's happening with rising sea level. Um, you know, of course, there's some uncertainty what's, with how that's going to affect um, the waterfront, but when you have a flowing structure, it can be adjusted to the rising level of the sea. Um, breakwater. So we did a study with a, a consultant by the name of Haying Company called Consulting Firm. And they confirmed that the pontoons would be effective wave attenuators at wave attenuators uh, at Beacon at the Beacon Wharf location. Uh, we do have that report available, and we'll provide it to your consultants there doing due diligence on the pontoon. Um, so this was our original proposal, and you can see how it, was, it had a breakwatering effect and a protected harbor in behind it. Um, Interestingly, there's, because as I mentioned, these are the last, this is the last section of pontoons. So we, ha we have kind of the proof is in the pudding, a ridge from the original installation of, of the pontoons, which were at Hood Canal. Here's some, here's just a, a, a very small, it's kind of wave action that came up across the pontoons. You can see the other side of the bridge is, is, is calm. Here's a very significant storm. Um, so you see wind and wave action. If you can see to the very far end, I'm guessing they're probably 30 foot over top of waves are coming over top the highway at that point in time. And you see on the right hand side of the photo on the other side, it's um, on the opposite side of the wind and wave action, it's calm up there. So benefit is a significant benefit of the pontoons. Other refurbished pontoons function as as I mentioned at Alberta. This is you can see in behind this pontoon set in that fishing harbor. And Horseshoe Bay, the intention of this primary function for this is to create a harbor and the real arena. Budget. Um, yeah. Sorry, Mike, was that it? It then is kind of quick. Oh, you're muted. I lost connection there, so I'm just trying to resurrect my... Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Wi-Fi dropped me there. Give me one sec and I'll zip to where we were. And back. Um, yeah, so, so very likely substantially less cost than the alternatives being a piled or a, or a rubble um, structure. Um, we are open to private partner triple P opportunities, um, whatever they may look like. Uh, you know, we certainly think that RFP would be the right way to go with this, and we'd be open to some sort of a lease arrangement or, or some sort of design build, um, something that we would certainly, um, um, something we'd be very open to. Purchase price for this section is $795,000 Canadian. Uh, there will be additional costs. They would include the bulkhead, which would be the shore side, the ramp, uh, marge system, as I mentioned, and the deck, and any other services, lighting, benches, electrical, et cetera. Um, interestingly, it's, it's, there's very, very much so environmental benefits. Uh, you have shadowing, which does have some impact on, on the habitat, but uh, obviously that versus rubble, dumping rubble on the water. It does create an alternative habitat over a period of time. You'd find that there'd be a completely different, um, you know, ecosystem of fish and, and wildlife that are attached to the underside of the bridge pontoon. Um, it's a big recycling project. You can imagine what uh, the energy and the, and the resource that we're putting into creating these pontoons, and that's something that would be uh, recycled into this opportunity. Um, there is a question about rear rear round building. Um, 
and I know that that might be something that's a desire of of the pontoons or of whatever replacement of, of the wharf is. In our view, um, year on buildings are not possible on the floating structure. Um, the challenges that you're faced with are wind and wave action, as you saw. You know the waves do come up and they'll come over top the pontoon, at, 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 and we do have some storms that hit Sydney. Um, there's some very real building code issues. Can you can you actually do that, or on any wharf structure out there? What are you know? Can you comply to building code? Um, fire department access is another challenge. Um, what options do you have? Obviously, you have seasonal temporary use that can very well be used with seasonal type buildings out there and and in a temporary basis. Uh, another way to deal with if you if you really would like to see a building out there is to have a separate piled structure that could be raised to to deal with kind of um, your concerns with with uh, or the concerns with rising sea levels. That's my presentation. That's what I've got for you. And as I mentioned, I think what I'd like you to take away is that if these are very substantial structures, they have been vetted and due diligence is done uh, on them by a variety of people and uh, entities, Port Alberni and I uh, heard Moffat Nickel engineers to help with their project. They brought up uh, concrete testers from San Diego and you know it, it was an extensive due diligence and they deemed it to be worthwhile for that, you know, as you might imagine, a very worthwhile um, expensive project in Port Alberni. Um, just to transport those pontoons to Australia was a huge number and they, they chose to, to um, expand that kind of money as opposed to building something from new, which is very difficult to do and replace these sorts of pontoons. So with that, um, yeah, I think we'd, we, we'd love to get involved um, with what's going on. Obviously, we've been longtime participants and stakeholders uh, in the Sydney waterfront and throughout Sydney, and uh, we think this is the best alternative for the replacement of the war. Open to any questions that you may have. So Rob, if I can approach Mike, uh, just a couple of clarifications. Mike, first of all, thanks very much. I think that was super informative and, and added a lot of clarity, uh, certainly. Nice to see the applications uh, you know, being used, uh, particularly the ones in British Columbia. Um, arguably, you know, they appear to be more protected environments. So I, I get your, your comment on the slide with respect to uh, year round buildings and, and your point of view that, that it wouldn't be uh, viable. Um, can you elaborate on your, in that same slide, you mentioned seasonal temporary. Um, so in, in your point of view, a, a seasonal structure may well be viable then. Is that my takeaway from that? Yeah, I think that, you know, there's, and, and again, I, I think it's going to be really working in conjunction with those folks who, you know, um, are going to um, provide the guidance with respect to building code, fire department, that those sorts of things, what, what you have to do to comply. But certainly you could see um, buildings that would be, uh, you know, with their, if they're recreationally based or if they're food and beverage based or some activity based buildings out there that, that could certainly be placed on a temporary basis on the pontoons. Um, I sure. think, yeah, is is the, the Port of Sydney, I know it's not yours, but the Port of Sydney uh, project there, their offices, their laundry facilities, Etc. Those are all on a floating um, structure inside. Yeah, the they are on a floating structure. They're in actually in a obviously in a very protected harbor there, where you're going to be exposed. And you know, and where we're talking about those, you have a massive rip rock breakwater that protects that marina there, and so it creates a protected okay. harbor that is just isn't going to be exposed to the elements that uh, you would with you know with a with a, a pier structure of some sort. Fair enough. Uh, my last question for Mike then, and it's just a clarification because I'm not sure I understood it correctly. Um, I, I think you mentioned this um, sort of the east side of the Hood Canal uh, bridge segments were replaced um, because the um, the pontoons, the concrete pontoons were failing, filling with salt water. Um, no, 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 there no. Been no, some no, penetration? No, no, not at all. No. Okay. So what took place is the um, so there's the east to west side of the bridge. It's it's essentially divided by the the center, um, you know, the the lock that allowed the boats come and go. Um, the west side. Um, so these pontoons are, if you're, you, there's hatch covers on them. There's a deck topping. If you open one of the deck covers off, you can look inside, and the typical pontoon is about 16 feet deep. They're massive caissons, and they're big floating, you know, big floating caissons. Um, what took place on the west side when it sunk is that 
this is my understanding is that some of the um, the workers or the the maintenance people left some of the hatch covers off. They were doing some yeah. work on it. So there, and then a massive storm came in, and because the hatch covers left off, the water um, filled up and created instability in the pontoons. That, yeah. in combination with the wind and wave action, anchors dragged and it went down. Got that. On the east side, what precipitated the replacement of, of the, the east side then? The east side is, was, uh, as I, the, the, the construction of the east side was then a earlier vintage than the west side was because the west side was built in 1981-ish. It was finished, I think, and put in place. So the west side had a different construction to it. The east side had the original 1960s construction. Yep. The pontoons, the caissons themselves are in terrific condition. As you might imagine, you know, there's no, there's not water coming into them. It's as, you know, because they've been reused in, in so many different kind of applications, it, they're very sound. What wasn't sound and what took place and kind of eroded was the columns, all the stuff that we took off basically of the pontoon structure. So the columns and the elevated roadway, um, that stuff, in particular the columns were, they made it, uh, made that out of a lighter weight aggregate. And the reason they did that was they were, it was lighter and you could save money on the, the pontoons that you have to build because it had, those pontoons had to hold up less structure. But that was what what was failing is what we actually took off the pontoons and recycled. The pontoons themselves are in terrific condition. High, you know, I said Army Corps of Engineer, high PSA concrete. Is, we worked with the concrete of the pontoons, and it's incredibly hard and it, they're sound um, in terms of water ingress. Thanks, Mike. That's helpful, and and certainly one of the items we're investigating are in partnerships. And so, really appreciate your your comment and openness to have that, that type of dialogue as well. Thanks. I'll turn it back to you, Rob. Any other questions for Mike then at this point or anybody else? Um, Mike, it's Scott here. Um, could I uh, just pose a question to you? First, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very uh, smooth and, and comprehensive and, and you know, you're a polished presenter, so good for you. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, I guess the peculiarity of the structure uh, you mentioned a couple of times, um, you know, with its uh, geometry and uh, leaving a you know space in the middle and the length dimension. Uh, have, have you thought about orientation and I guess um, physically, if we wanted to have that that you know the length of the span, um, what sort of cost? How, how complicated is it to modify um, um, the structure? Well, so anyway, in terms of yeah, I'm I, I, I kind of had a. It, I had a disclaimer in before. I'm, I'm definitely not an engineer. I've done, I've worked a lot with engineers on these floating structures, so I can't really speak on a professional level, but what I understand the best way to orientate it would be with the open end coming into, so you get southeasters here, so the open end would probably be more in, orientated in that way to get the best kind of wave attenuation out of it. You got a large footprint with those, um, those struts that are underwater there um, that create wave, wave attenuation. In terms of you know the budget that you might spend on it, it you know that is really an open-ended question because you can do all kinds of things. You could you these the the design of them are really terrific because you can run um, services inside the pontoons. You could do lighting. You could do all kinds of things on the pontoons. Um, I kind of highlighted the most um, kind of the most substantial components of what you might see, what you might need to do there. You know, there's even a suggestion that you could use the existing wharf structure for a period of time because it's not going to fall into the ocean necessarily. It's just kind of coming to the end of its useful life. But you could use the existing wharf structure potentially as the upshore side of it and then build off of that. But if, you're, if it was going to be replaced altogether, you'd build a, a bulkhead on the, on the shore side and then a ramp down and then, a, and then a, a, you know, you'd, you'd span that of some description. And it really depends on what you want it, you know, what kind of loading that you want to put on it and what kind of stuff you want to put it at the end of the day. So I can't really answer that question. We could certainly, you know, if it gets to a point where this is, is, is creating, you know, it's, it's getting to a position in, in the, um, in the town's mind that it seriously wants to consider that we could certainly get involved in some budgeting for it. Sure. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe I've just a follow up. Thank you for that. That's, that's useful. And uh, just a follow up question. If we, were to explore this partnership idea, um, the, I, I guess we would have to enter that with kind of a fulsome assessment of what the possibilities are in terms of 
um, entrepreneurial aspects of it or, or uh, linkages, but um, it, it looks like you already considered that in the earlier visioning that you proposed to the town. And I, I assume that the marina facility itself was kind of the desirable side of it from your point of view, or is, is basically all options open from a partnership point of view? Yeah, like certainly the marina was, that was the economic engine for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's not something that would, there wouldn't be a marina behind this Benny stretch. You don't have the extent of breakwater and then to create a protected right. harbor that you could create that sort of uh, economic generator. I think, you know, what we feel the right way to approach this would be is through an RFP and through an RFP, there would be, you know, there'd be, um, you know, proposals that would be put forward and we could, we could address it that way. Um, in right. terms of economic generators, you know, it's, it's, it is something that is going to be able to generate a certain amount, but it's, you know, we think any structure that's going to go up there is, is not going to, you know, it's not going to pay for itself, put it that way. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, um, Jen. Sorry, if I uh, can just uh, clarify something. I know Mike mentioned using the existing wharf as the uh, bulkhead for the future structure, but the existing wharf, um, just so everyone knows, has been reviewed by a structural engineer and isn't um, rated for vehicle traffic. So if that was something that you know we wanted to look at, we would need to do some upgrades to the existing wharf before uh, anything could actually drive on it. Scott, did you want? No, I, I feel uh, that was an informative uh, update. Thanks very much. Yeah, Mike, it's actually, it was an excellent presentation. It's a, I think it gives a lot of food for thought. Are there any other questions from anybody else on the, looks quite quiet. <laughs> if that's the case, then I guess we could let you go. I'm sure we will have a lot of, uh, a lot of food for thought out of that though. Yeah, I am in, you know, I'm, I've been, providing information um, to your consultants in terms of the review of it. And we'll continue to do that. And I know they've been up there and taking a look at it. So um, yeah, we'll just- um, Yeah, we've- certainly be able. Yeah, again, we, we've got the upcoming meetings with, uh, with SNC and uh, I think between all of that, there's gonna be a lot of good input for sure. Yeah, great. Yeah. Great, well, thanks for having me. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Any other discussion people want to have on that before we move on? It gets a uh, drop, but, or do we just leave it at that for the moment? No, I mean, a couple of quick thoughts having seen this now. Um, and I guess, uh, Scott, I think you're getting at a little bit about how the thing is oriented. If it's oriented, as he was saying, to protect against Southeast storms, it begs the question of, if it's doing a good job to help as a floating wave attenuator to help take away storm waves, would we be able to have structures on shore without having to have the full-blown higher elevation that comes with the breakwater options that were proposed? Because this, if this thing was taking away most of the uh, damaging waves, would we be able to have structures on shore that we can't have permanently on this thing um, and have everything at a lower elevation. I don't know, Jen or anybody want to, it's just food for thought. I mean, I've seen this thing a couple of times. I think the challenge of having structures on the shore would be where you would put them because uh, it would seem like they'd have to go in uh, Beacon Park. Well, or I guess the other, I guess one of the things, and of course we're getting to a couple of things coming up next on the agenda, but one of the thoughts quickly, and it's just brainstorming was, could you have a smaller build out? You take away the war, if you have a very, you, you basically build out with very little and a much lower elevation than if you didn't have something like this in front of it, you would have some land for say the fish market, but you wouldn't have to be building it anywhere near 11, 12, uh, you know, 10, 11 meters in, elevation because you'd have this huge thing out in the water. So it's providing the breakwater function that allows you to have a lower elevation on the shore side. 
so you would have less to build out from shore. It's just throwing that out there is the type of thing that uh, makes you think about. It. It's almost a combination of options here. I guess, I guess, Rob, the, the, I guess the one question is, is again, the availability of land, um, you know, associated uh, at the base, at the, you know, at the, at the foot of this thing or wherever a bulkhead potentially might be. It's, uh, I think, I think there are some real limitations there in terms of potential amount of land associated, you know, for, for buildings, but uh, yeah. Well, I guess what I'm thinking, Jan, to what you said, if the current wharf is not rated and it was going to be gone anyway as a result of all this, and this thing is, I think the draft is about 23 feet. So there is a gap between shore and where this pontoon would start. Anyway, I mean, it's getting into detail, but it's, the, it's just that it begs the question about some infill or something that would be added that would extend out the land a bit but at a lower elevation because you're not dealing with, um, because you don't have to worry as nearly as much about the, uh, the kind of four meter storm waves. Sorry, anyways. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, an interesting point. I can see a bulkhead that has more of a, a symbolic structure than a functional one. Maybe just a photo op kind of reproduction of what's there right now as opposed to something that's going to be in use. Hmm. Because anyway, we're, still dealing, we're still dealing with the whole market lease issue and- uh, Right, sorry, um, don't want to go down a rabbit hole. Just wanted to mention that it, it, begs, it begs certain questions and that's partly what we want to get to next. Sarah, Allison, I mean. Sorry, I just want to comment there that, I mean, we, there would be a lot of options to look at for how to tie in how to make that connection from the land area of the park down to a floating structure, whether the whole thing is a ramp or whether you need to build out at grade and then drop down. I think that that would have to be looked at in terms of how to connect the two right. and how large that would be and what would go on it. And do we need anything more than a ramp there? Or yeah, that would have to be looked at. Yeah, I guess it's it's brainstorming whether or not there would be some options there given, what, given that there's a connection that would have to be built anyway. Okay, if there's nothing else, then we want to just to move on. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll just to, make a, sorry. A general comment. I, I sort of think the key thing for me personally is the SNC evaluation. Um, I mean, that was an excellent presentation, and it is. I have worked at that uh, wharf in um, uh, one of the wharfs that he that was sold, so I've seen it in action, and it's you know they are substantial structures, but. The one that we're left with considering here is a bit peculiar in my mind, and I wouldn't <laughs> I mind an appraisal by SNC about the sort of exotic geometry of these two sections and the interconnections underneath. And it seems to me uh, from a building code, mechanical engineering point of view, a performance point of view, there's a few eccentricities related to this, you know, rather unique piece of equipment. <laughs> Plus from our point of view, from uh, aesthetics, it is kind of a, a size dimension that's not really what we had in mind uh, in terms of fitting it with what's already there and trying to match kind of the same kind of footprint. This kind of has a, a real different footprint to it. So it's clearly a topic for, for, for more serious discussion, but let's, if it's okay, Rob, I would suggest we wait for S&C and, mm -hmm. you know, pose a few technical questions to them or they've probably already considered these technical issues. Right. Well, I guess, um... SNC is clearly going at a more general floating option and evaluating this as only one input on that, right? I'm sort of Fair enough, but I think they're going to put their finger on some of these more practical issues with, with more engineering experience. At least I hope they are. Maybe Jen, do you think they will? <laughs> Maybe that's an overstatement. Yeah, I mean, they're, they, they went out and reviewed this structure in particular. So I think they will be, you know, having this, the structure in mind when they're doing their analysis. So yeah, I'll, I can follow up to make sure that's the, the case, but I, I am under that impression as well. Well, I guess when we have the next meeting with SNC, one of the things that we could talk about it was regarding some of the scope and things that they're looking at now is make sure that some of these things that this is making us think of are factored in. That was one of the reasons we wanted to have those uh, checkpoints in with them as they go through their project. Okay, if there's nothing else you wanna 
um, jump to item seven, which is the more specific items for discussion in November that we've got listed here. And there are three um, that we put on the agenda. The first one, and this is basically, this is trying to get to the into more of the real work and thing and stuff that we can actually start to use to close off ultimately some of these options. Um, the first item A, rank the options based on the environmental impact and the suggestion being by next month's meeting. And essentially just have a subcommittee look at this from the point of view of, I guess, largely like for instance, a high level review based on what we already know from the SNC Lavalin report. The question, do we need more info or not? Or do we say, you know, the environmental impact of any of these options is not either a showstopper or one isn't necessarily so much better than all the others that it's obvious. Maybe that's the conclusion. Mm -hmm. But getting to the point where we have conclusions like that in, ter in terms of helping us prioritize options here. So I, I think, you know, that we can do this. Like I, I'm, uh, my background's environmental consulting and I, I've done a lot of environmental, marine environmental impact assessment. So um, I think my opinion's pretty reasonable about feasibility of what can be done within a certain amount of time. Um, I, I expect that there'll be no difficulty concluding that there are no showstoppers for any of those options. Um, the environmental impacts will be different. Likely there will be some significant differences and um, the kind of thing that would be necessary to, to actually rank the options properly would be um, proposed footprints of the different options. Because it, even with the floating structure, um, you could center the ramp in the middle of the structure or you could have the ramp you know, come down on the east side of the structure and have it shift you know, the overall footprint more to the north. Um, and, and really the question is what's gonna be underneath the footprint um, that's gonna determine the impact. So I don't think we have the level of detail to actually do it. Like the options aren't um, clear enough to rank it properly. Uh, could give you some general commentary on the nature of the impacts. Yeah, I think Peter, what, what, one of the things that, um, that I know I had in mind was it's not that we actually try to do anything in any detail at this point, because I agree 100%. Until you actually look at a specific footprint, let's say the floating structure, the shadowing that's actually there. We know DFO cares a lot about shadowing, just like they do rubble. It's more a question of being able to start saying which of all the different things that we, that we know about do or don't materially affect a final decision or recommendation. Yeah. Um... And if this is one that we could basically park and put aside and say, yes, we know that we, like SNC has already said, and it makes sense, anything to do with rubble will probably have a bigger footprint impact than obviously it piles with a deck. Um, actually, I don't know if that's the case, because if you're doing the piles, you're going to have a lot of pile driving, which is a lot of uh, uh, acoustic disturbance. And uh, we have a lot of marine mammals in the area. Oh, I know. They want, and what they do is they make you have somebody monitoring for the mammals being in the Our area. And stuff. If it's pile driving, but then if it's vibrating, they don't necessarily care as much, right? Yeah. It, so the devil's kind of in the details. It is. So that's why I'm saying, I, given that we can't know for sure, it's just that even if all we did was document quickly, and that's why we said by December, because it's a very quick pass, really. It's just to start putting something down a little bit more conclusively, if that's at all possible, even if it's just to say, you know, set it aside and move on with all the other issues affecting these options and final recommendations, which may be the case. But even if that is the case, let's put something down on paper that way. It definitely, we could uh, do some kind of environmental impact screening. The question of uh, how definitive the conclusions, that really depends on the level of detail on, on the options, like the foot, specifically the footprints. 
I guess well, if you look at the options that they shortlisted option, I'm thinking like the four or five, A5, B6, and then if we had floating, do you think there's enough detail on those drawings that SNC provided that we could use those? Because um, they were pretty specific, at least they showed an actual layout. Um, a couple of them were using the same square footage as today's wharf and, and, uh, and then the one that's reduced. I guess the question is whether those are illustrative or whether those are actually the proposed footprints. I suspect they're more illustrative. Yeah, I'm sure they are a little more illustrative, but at least they, you know, like we could very quickly overlay them with um, their their images of the seabed and just say yep. something at least, right? Oh, like I said, I'm sure we can say something. Yeah, that's all I think at this point. And then at that point, if you say, you know, to go any further, we need to, anything further is dependent upon a final design and uh, recommendation, which is great. Yeah. Uh, but at least we would be saying, okay, we can park it and then move on and use other issues to help with the selection. I, I'm pretty confident you can do that. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like you're volunteering for the subcommittee. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's something I have certainly have background on. Okay. I mean, I'd be happy to work with uh, with each of these myself. Any, um, are there anyone else that would like to basically, we could put down names right now if you like, <clears throat> um, because if we can do this without having to hire anyone, especially at this, at this point in the project, that would be great. Can I suggest one other member of this committee and um, yeah. perhaps I can um, uh, corral a couple of volunteers from the oceanographic community? Well, that would be great. I mean, I was going to suggest three people from the committee, just so there's an odd number. Um, so if there was a third member of the committee who wanted to join with Peter, and I'm happy to work on this one. And I, I guess the expectation is the volunteer is not going to actually have to do any environmental in, impact assessment. You're no. there as an observer to keep the rest of us honest. Yeah. We'll try to uh, uh, find two other environmental impact people that will contribute their expertise. Yeah. Pretty, pretty sure I can rope some people into it. Anyone else? Scott, do you want to? Well, I beg your pardon, Rob, but why don't we look to have, um, you know, one of the appointed members, one member of council, one member of staff on each subcommittee, Jen, assuming that staff would have time to be uh, involved, one member each on a subcommittee. Sure, I can sit on this uh, subcommittee. Um, I was going to recommend this one because I'm not expecting staff will have to do any work. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Just Scott here, just a, I guess a point of clarification. So we're talking about a subcommittee who's going to meet to talk about conceptual schemes and assess environmental impact. Uh, there's a lot of wishy-washiness in that. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, how, how does a, how meaty will the subcommittee's recommendations be if we have all of this moving targets on, on the footprint and various things. I mean, Peter, will will the guidance the subcommittee give, do you think, be helpful to us? Or will we have to redo this all over again once uh, we move closer to uh, real design issues? We can do some work that would only need to be updated. Like um, one of the basic starts on this kind of thing is you do a, an impact interaction matrix where uh, each one of the options, you look at the, the mechanisms of impact that are associated with it, and whether the, um, the communities under the footprint are different, like substantially different or quantitatively different. And then um, you've got, uh, uh, you know, the basic building blocks of doing the full environmental assessment from there. Okay. So we, we're getting the basics started and then we just tune it up as, as more knowledge comes to the table. If, and also if we think we need it, because when you're doing an environmental impact assessment, um, one possibility is that your initial screening concludes that the impacts aren't significant enough to warrant going the full distance. 
Mm -hmm. You know, if the impacts look like they're going to be minor, DFO might be open to uh, uh, some kind of, um, you know, uh, compensation uh, proposal and not require us to do the full impact assessment. Right. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, and, and Scott, just to clarify, my thinking was this is trying to look at, in order to make it not too open ended, specifically the shortlisted options that SNC Lavalin already signaled, plus yeah. this floating option. Yep. Um, and that's why December, because it's also assuming that we're going to get some input from SNC on the floating. Um, and we said it's basically trying to say on a, on a high level, is there is it something that we say, okay, we can take it to a certain point as Peter is saying. After that, you say, okay, you're gonna to have to then, you should, only, you should only go much further if you select one. And you also have hopefully been able to conclude that it doesn't, it's not a showstopper to anything, just to make and to at least document that further. Which I think is what we're all maybe assuming, but it'd be nice to actually capture it, which is why we put it down as December. It's a relatively quick project. Um, the next one is a little harder, <laughs> ranking the options based on the view impact. Um, what this goes back to is the height. Uh, the floating option, obviously, as we just heard, one of the big appeals on the surface of that is the idea that you don't have a big height change. When you look at options 4, 5A, 5B, and 6, and so on from SNC, you're looking at the crest levels anywhere from 8 to 9 meters. Uh, chart datum, and we're uh, close to the five and a half we are now. So for instance, one of the questions that comes up is um, how much of a radical difference, like you say, oh, eight or nine meters. Well, a meter is over three feet. So if one of the options is over three feet lower than the others, how significant is that from the point of view of being able to work with it on that site? If I was um, going to be asked to make a decision about it, I would be thinking of have somebody take a picture looking out towards Beacon Wharf from um, the patio at Beacon Landing. Mm -hmm. uh, take another photo maybe from the patio at um, uh, the 10 Acres restaurant at, at the Pier Hotel, and then have somebody Photoshop to uh, show the respective height. Uh, right. And because a view is a visual impact and if somebody can do a decent job with the mock-ups and I, I think that's not that challenging um, to do, that uh, that would be the way to take that on. And it could be something, I agree, it could be something as simple as that where you could start by actually having something at the height. Like I think Scott, when you and I visited the site, we were actually looking at the height relative to the sidewall on the fish market. So you could actually go and indicate in real life what it looks like, take these pictures so that when you Photoshop something as you're saying, Peter, you're actually able to indicate exactly what the height would really be because you have a, you have a, start, you have a reference point in the actual underlying photographs. And then we have something to go on as opposed to only saying, oh, it's eight meters, it's nine meters. You know, um, we all know that this is a big issue, but having this, we just need to start getting to grips with this. Yeah, sorry, Randy. I'm wondering if, if Peter's, Peter's suggestion is a, a good one. I think that, uh, that um, getting a, a visual image of, of um, the the uh, the height and scale of of um, the various options is is going to definitely be helpful. But I'm, you know, in terms of in terms of taking a photograph and then superimposing an image, um, that image uh, that is actually going to be to scale. Uh, is it is this where maybe um, spending some consulting dollars, some design dollars, there might be some value here uh, to get. Um, I mean, I mean, certainly, you know, staff might be able to take a crack at this, but uh, what's going to be key fundamentally, if there's going to be value here, is getting the appropriate scale. And um, I'm not sure 
I'm not sure, um, in General Allison, maybe you can weigh in, but uh, I mean, do we have that capacity in house? Randy, I was going to make the same observation. I, I think uh, I had a funny experience just recently sitting right where I am now. Uh, a drone suddenly appeared outside my window and it was a, a real estate company uh, imaging my neighbor's property. Um, and I, I think the, these real estate companies have a, you know, they have people who just do that on the cheap, right? And I think a number of perspectives, I, I agree, you know, maybe we could do it just from the rum runner and you know, mm -hmm. 10 acre or whatever, but actually a drone image would be really valuable, I think, to be able to give a kind of a perspective in several ways. Um, and I, I doubt it's hugely expensive to uh, to get one of those companies that works with real estate agents to uh, help us out. Um, something to consider maybe. Sorry, hey, Allison had her hand up. Um, just to weigh in on that for the staff's capability on assisting with that, I think staff has the capability to do up kind of a rendering. It might not be exactly the scale. So it depends how how exact we want to be on this. Um, maybe Councillor Wainer can speak more to that. Um, the, the GIS uh, uh, section at the town has actually done some 3D imagery of uh, the town already. Yeah. And you'll see a couple of examples posted on the the town's website, that's actually done with a 3D model underneath, right? And then you drape the image over it. And it's pretty easy to, you know, superimpose a, a rectangular uh, structure on that 3D model and then drape the image. So I think you're going to find that, um, that our staff can do that in-house. Um, but certainly if they can't, it won't be very expensive to farm it out. Okay. Is this idea making sense to everybody? Is something we do, is it something that we should do? Yeah. I think maybe we're trying to take this a little far. I think it's the idea is to rank the options and uh, just basically say, if it's option A, there's uh, likely to be a lower profile than currently exists. Option B would be roughly equivalent. Option C would especially with buildings would be substantially higher and that kind of thing. I think it's only the ones we actually put out for consultation where we might need this kind of rendering to be uh, illustrative. Well, I think the subcommittee can figure it out. Frankly, um, we should really just look for participants who want to serve on the subcommittee and, and, and then they will uh, look at how they're going to bring this back to the full committee. And I'm not volunteering for this one, but I'll volunteer for the next one, uh, the uh, partnership one. Okay. I guess, um, I guess, and just to address that, and the, again, I'm looking at it, it, what triggered this was also looking at, for instance, the shortlisted options and saying, gee, you know, nine meters versus eight meters. And you think at first, well, it's only one meter. And then you stop and think, well, wait a minute, three and a half feet practically. Um, you know, and maybe all of them are just too high. And we, without anything modeled up at all, you know, maybe the conclusion is none of them are any good. That's always a possibility. Or we might conclude that a one meter difference is colossal. So I just thought it's one of those things where we've got to move the ball forward here a little bit. So if we can, again, if we can do it fairly cheaply and have something that's at least relatively decent between drone images, other images, 3D modeling and so on, at least it gives us something to help maybe just give us a little bit more guidance, certainly more than we have now. Jim. Um, I will sit on this committee as well. And uh, I think there's someone who might be able to um, help with imaging in our department. Um, so I'll see what we can do with, with respect to that. Okay, so Jen's on both of them now so far. Anyone, uh, anyone else want to do this one? Sure, I will. Sorry? Sarah, thank you, Sarah. Um, anyone else or do I have to jump on this one too? Scott, do you wanna do this one? I, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, uh, I wouldn't mind, I do see this, the, the comment was made, uh, um, you know, this sort of matches with the consultation side of it. Um, so this subcommittee, maybe we should be also thinking about 
part of this visualization step, I think is really critical in terms of the, the next, you know, the, the future consultation with uh, the community, obviously. Um, so I do think it's pretty, we should take this fairly seriously because it's such a, it's obvious it's going to be such a, a community issue, the, the viewscape and the footprint, et cetera. Um, so I, I would say, why not invest in this, uh, you know, and, and maybe Jen will guide us to the right person internally, that'll come easy. But I would say effort to, to, to do this really with a view towards consultation is probably a good idea. Um, it, you know, makes good sense. And I, I don't think it'll be terribly expensive. So I wouldn't hesitate to plunge into this one with a little enthusiasm. Jen, you wanna? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind just adding that we can, we can start internally and see our capabilities. And if we find that we're not able to do it um, to the right level of detail or um, accuracy, then we can go external if that works for everyone. Is the time frame realistic? Do you think that we got we put it down as tentatively after um, for the January meeting, two months? Again, yeah. I think it, it depends on our uh, workload um, and if if our internal staff are able to do it or if we would have to uh, contract it out. But maybe we we'll report back at the next meeting and um, okay. provide an update on timing if that works. Okay. Yeah. I assume the lack of giant Christmas parties this year, cry, is, is a factor too. <laughs> we all have more time on our hands in theory, right? Uh, sadly. Okay. Um, so thank you guys. Um, then the C option, basically the P3 opportunities. This was one of the things again, right out of the approach report and it was on our Gantt chart to be um, starting to hit. Um, the thinking here was having this on again on the subcommittee, but having it a little bit more in the background till February, partly just to sp spread these three things out. Um, ideas like past precedents, what kind of P3 opportunities have there been? Um, funding from levels of government and uh, is there any indication of post-pandemic, any feel yet, post-pandemic? For instance, is the federal government going to feel like throwing lots and lots of money at infrastructure projects in order to help get the economy going? They, Don't know. But people they, that could look at that, it would be, you know, because I mean, if we're talking about this being in a, one of those things, I think I mentioned this to Jen the other day, I said, you know, if this is one of those projects where if the five year from four or five year from now, you want to do it, and but it's got to be ready, the so-called shovel ready status for funding, you know, even getting a feel for that, I don't know. So anyway, that was, that was the thinking behind this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's premature to look for grant programs now because truly, truly this project is three to five years away. Uh, in terms of the P3, that uh, is the nature of this item. There's a bit of a disconnect between this and the action plan in terms of timing. Mike Cronquist mentioned that uh, they could potentially respond to an RFP, but I'm thinking an, a, a full out, uh, full on RFP process would likely be um, a fairly lengthy one. I'm not sure it can fit in within the, the timing of this committee's work. So maybe just a matter of uh, soliciting a proposal just from um, whatever the marker group or whatever they're calling themselves as opposed to putting something out. Uh, but there's also the issue of um, a P3 might only make sense if we're still considering the inclusion of commercial buildings on the wharf. And if we throughout the next couple of months narrowed it, narrow it down that in, in terms of that being non-viable, then I think that takes P3 off the table because I don't see any other way to monetize this. And that's obvious, and that is a huge consideration. One of the other reasons that we sort of put this down is a little bit longer, like February, on the assumption that it kind of runs in the background a little bit because of because of exactly that type of thing. To, for a P3 to be viable, you have to consider what the revenue opportunities would be to the private partner. Mm -hmm. And if there's, if there's no structures on something and we still decide that there's something viable to do, then 
maybe that's just not going to be there, right? I'll volunteer for this one. Okay. And Allison, you had your hand yeah. up. Is that a volunteer or just a comment? I, I can volunteer for this one as well. I um, also wanted to comment on a few things there. Um, if we were to do an RFP process, I think just thinking out loud, we probably would want to do that when we had decided on a structure type and not just do an RFP process with an open-ended send us something that you'd like to do. Also to speak to the business opportunity, if there's no structures, there could still be a business opportunity for something that doesn't include structures like a marina, like moorage, like uh, some type of ocean operation that requires, that requires access from a structure. So just because there's no structures doesn't mean that there's no business involvement there. So there might be other options that haven't been considered yet. Yeah, I mean, point taken. For instance, if there was, as we just saw in the presentation today, a floating structure that could handle moorage and it had no buildings on it, that's, that's right. still that, there's still revenue opportunities potentially there. Yeah. yeah. Jen. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify that this point is not, um, you know, to actually go to RFP or get proposals. It's more to think about if that's even something that we want to do. Um, I don't think that the goal of this subcommittee would be to actually put out any sort of proposal. It would be just to decide if eventually we want to go that route. So. Yeah, and even just to have a scan on what people think, because I think it's the point was just made. If it's, say, three to five years from now before anything actually, an RFP was even being fully developed to put out, who knows, the world will have changed a lot between now and then. So obviously the scan at this point is preliminary, but that's, and that's all it would be. Chad, you said your hand up for this one too, didn't you? Correct, Rob, yeah. Great. So Randy, did you? Yeah. yeah. Volunteering had a comment. Yeah, um, no, I, um, if, if, um, if my good friend Andrew is volunteering, then, uh, then I certainly, uh, certainly leave that up to him, but I, I will provide some assistance um, as part of this, I was um, involved in uh, an RFP for the for the uh, replacement of the wharf a number of years ago, and uh, that we uh, we put out. Um, and at the time, unfortunately, we we really didn't um, we didn't get any real uh, response uh, to that RFP. Really, at the time, because there was no you know um, business value. Uh, associated with uh, with it, and, and I think that was the that was the challenge at the time. But um, that's not to say that um, we shouldn't be um, shouldn't be at least exploring these opportunities, and we can dig out uh, some of that uh, some of that um, information that was related to that RFP back when. And uh, and um, you know, again, there's a there's certainly a template there, so yeah, we can uh, we can provide that information to the group. Yeah, like something you're touching on just makes me think, you know, past precedence. Um, is it possible that you get some feel that says that if you don't have at least this much, whatever that might be in the terms of structures, marina, whatever, if it's not at a certain level, it's not going to appeal to people? I don't know. Maybe have a feel for that from the past. I, I don't know. But that's all we're looking for then is input that way. I think an aspect, too, that the group should consider is, you know, again, at the end of the day, if we're considering an RFP and we're considering a, a, a P3 opportunity, um, is it, um, you know, is there an opportunity for, for someone else, quite frankly, to uh, a private entity to actually uh, um, own the wharf? Like, do, is, there, is it a piece of infrastructure that we necessarily want to, uh, want to, uh, want to own and, um, and then turn it over to a private entity to, to look at, uh, what potential value they might be able to accrue out of something like this. So again, I think there's, there's different ways of looking at, uh, at um, ownership structure as well. So um, yeah, it's worth exploring. It just reminds me of a background question I had regarding um, after seeing um, the presentation earlier, and maybe somebody knows, but I don't think I've seen it. The actual water lot license footprint we have today is there is that shown somewhere? I can't remember where I've seen or haven't seen it. So when you suddenly see a two hundred foot structure floating like he showed sticking out, is that is it something that would require a new water lot license area? We have the water lot 
lines on our zoning map. So on the town's website, I think that's that you can see kind of the extent of the water lot on that map. It doesn't have the dimensions on, but the map is to scale. So I think right. that the, the length of do of wharf, the floating dock that was shown today, I think it would go past the water lot. Maybe Jen could speak to that. Yeah, I'm not surprised, but yeah, it just, I um, it'll go past depending on the orientation of it. That's it right. would. Okay. Which might inform, which might be a detail under the environmental consideration as well, because if you looked at what he showed today and you think of it sticking out past the water lot license, then Peter, I just know DFO would just love us for that, but yeah. Well, it, you know, like I said, it's the size of the footprint and DFO doesn't care about size of water lot. They care about what's under it. True. No, that's a provincial thing, isn't it? Well, the problem is Can I just ask Randy a question? You, you mentioned the... Oh. Uh, go ahead, Scott. Scott? Oh. I think he's... It his froze. video just froze. Yeah. <clears throat> we had a question, but I don't know what it was now. So... Okay, anything else uh, related to those three? We've got three subcommittees and it sounds like it's making sense to everybody, I hope it is. Um, item D, confirming the SNC scope. Um, actually, did Tara have your hand up? Oh, yes, sorry, I, I, just, I just want to double check on the members of that subcommittee. Was that Chad, Allison, and Andrew? That's uh, what I wrote down, Chad, Allison, okay. and Andrew. Happy to let Randy replace me if he wants to. I'll, uh, I'll work with you on that, Andrew, for sure. Okay. So we had you uh, four people on there. And you okay, Sarah? Then? Okay, perfect. Confirming the SNC scope, uh, item D. Um, Jen, do you want to just, I think it's pretty clear. Do you want to just quickly walk us through that one if you can? Sure, sorry, before I start, Scott, did you want to ask a question? You oh, Scott, you, you're back on, you're, well, you froze. You have a question? Oh, I think I'm freezing again. All right, I'll take a pass. Oh, it did freeze. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, then uh, I'll walk through the SNC scope um, just to confirm. Um, there's some things that we've talked about um, maybe adding in there, wanting to know if we actually want to uh, include them. So things that are, that we've already agreed were within the existing scope are cost and feasibility of the floating structure, um, cost estimate to review or remove the existing structure, um, the memo addressing buildings on the floating structure. I'm assuming that's something we still want them to do, even with um, Mike Cronquist's uh, feedback on that. I feel like if Mike has said no and he's the guy who's trying to sell them to us and uh, and they've already preliminary said no. We... I wonder about from the seasonal, sorry, sorry. I wonder about from the seasonal aspect then, Jen, if we could keep that there because I thought his answer was a little less definitive on, on the seasonal side. So, but yeah. we've already agreed. You've talked to SNC Lavalon, so I'd, I'd keep him at it. I, I would agree on keeping it in because for the public consultation, it would be great to have a letter that actually recommend, you know, that says you can't have structures year round. Because otherwise it's just kind of hearsay and we don't want that on for something that's significant. Right. And I believe Peter as well, um, we, we said in the last meeting that one of the reasons for getting this was to help tighten um, and get more, tighten the scope slightly, but get more detail analysis out of SNC level about a floating structure solution. If they, if they say quickly, take this off the table, we think they, we felt they would do a better job because they would have less to think about in terms of trying to accommodate, because they're looking at not just that one floating structure, they're talking about floating structures in general that we could use. So that was another good reason to get, still have that from them. So it stays, Jen. Yes. Yeah, so Great. And then the next one was uh, 
cost and feasibility of maintaining the existing wharf, how often we'd have to do those renovation projects that we did this year and how quickly those will add up to, you know, potentially costing the same as replacing the wharf. So have them look at that. Do you um, have a ballpark for the cost magnitude of, of these add-ons? Not at this time. I can ask for ask for that and send it to um, the committee offline and see if everyone agrees to it. It um, I'm not expecting it's going to be too expensive, and I trust staff's discretion to bring it back if you think it's uh, uh, the price they're quoting is is uh, too high. Um, the next one is uh, determine the life cycle cost of each, each option. So, I mean, the maintaining the existing wharf that would be already covered in um, item four here, but looking at the life cycle costs of um, the floating structure, the rubble mounted structure and the new piled structure um, options, depending on the size and configuration of each. Does everybody agree that we would like to include that? That would make sense. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, and then another thing we kind of touched on was uh, comparing the CRD's flood construction level study to SNC's feasibility, the, their um, earlier feasibility study. Um, this might be something that's you know outside of the scope of this um, uh, committee. Just wanted to confirm that that was something we don't want SNC to look at. It would seem to me that. Um wouldn't be worth getting them to do that unless we actually collect some winter storm wave data. Okay, so we can leave that off for now. And if we decide in the future, we wanna look at it, um, we could treat it as a change order at that time. Okay, was there anything else that anybody wanted added onto SNC's scope? That's all for that. Okay, uh, Jan. Just one point, a clarification point. Do you know when the next the next meeting that was a check in meeting with them? Is there any idea when that might happen? I haven't scheduled it yet, but I can follow up with them. Um, they might be uh, have some more information now that they've um, actually reviewed the the pontoon structure. Okay. Okay, because that was the intent. There was that that might help us to make sure that they're getting as focused as we can get them. Especially if at the same time, say they had the memo about structures. Okay, anything else regarding those guys? All right, um, we have no correspondence uh, for this meeting. Next thing then is a uh, general discussion. Anything that anybody wants to just touch on? Well, we've got a few minutes left. I was gonna say, did staff get what they wanted uh, out of item number six, the uh, options action plan? I think we need to go back to it. Okay. You want to go back to it? Please. Okay. Why don't you tell us what you want out of it? That might help direct the conversation then. Yeah. Sorry, Jenna. We just put this together as um, we gave it our best shot in terms of um, timing and responsibility but it's really just the two of us so far um, deciding on this stuff. And we would appreciate if the rest of the committee reviewed and either indicated agreement or disagreement with the, either the timing or who should be responsible. It doesn't have to be necessarily now. Um, if you're not ready to do that, it could be for the next meeting, but we kind of see this as a more detailed action plan that will be bringing elements forward each and every meeting based on uh, this draft. Anything to add, Jen? I was just going to say, um, if, if uh, anybody want, you can email me um, recommended changes or comments on it and I can kind of compile them and bring them back either to the next meeting or we can um, email it around offline and then bring a final version to the next meeting, if that would be easiest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could we all take an action to do that? Um, because one of the things that having this dovetail with actual concrete work that we're really starting to kick off now and just making sure that it's it's not kind of no pun intended floating off to the side mm -hmm. 
the um, <laughs> sorry, Jen. <laughs> In, in terms of uh, discussing what's in front of us, um, the, the one I would uh, pick up on quickly is your 4CII. Uh, and basically that's uh, if they're going to be public um, uh, facilities, washrooms, community gathering place, et cetera, um, you know, the feasibility of that. and this ii says if public then at the town's cost um and there's effort involved in determining you know potential cost recovery from leases and stuff like that and i don't think it's worth um uh putting the effort into that like i i don't see any meaningful opportunity for public washrooms or community gathering structure out there um, like, uh, I'd like to see the commercial demonstrate some feasibility before I see staff spending any time on, uh, public facilities that would only work if the commercial is viable. Fair enough. So is everyone in agreement to remove that action from this list? I think so, I'm fine with it. Yeah. I am as, yeah. I am as well. The, the only thing I can see is that it, it does feed into the, the issue about how that affects the waterfront vision since that having that as a public space was in there and we don't have that, that's down here as a discussion for, for council much later. So I'm almost wondering if we need to then kind of bump that up to a council discussion sooner. Guys, can you? <laughs> um, <sorry. laughs> Guys, please, just for a second while I'm talking. Um, yeah, so be because that does affect the waterfront vision and that, that key piece of having the public facilities on the dock, then I'm wondering if we should bump that out to a council discussion sooner, just to have that be something that's a public discussion that, that comes out um, so that it's not that we just made that kind of as a committee? I, I don't think it's actually eliminating uh, the public uh, use of the space per the waterfront vision because the vision is anticipating commercial uses out there too. And if the commercial uses aren't feasible, then I think it's appropriate to have the council discussion to have the discussion without knowing about the feasibility of the commercial uses is probably not going to be a very useful discussion. And I think we see some of those consultation um, opportunities and some similar discussion throughout uh, 4D. Um, you know, speaking of uh, you know, the perceived uh, value, heritage value of the fish market, et cetera. So there is some, in my mind, there's some crossover there. So I, I think it's uh, opportunity at least to get, uh, per your um, concern, Councilor Duncan, I agree, some of that uh, out before the, uh, before the community as well during that phase. The other one I would ask whether it's the mandate for this committee is um, E, the question about the Bevan fishing pier, do we need both, if only one, which? Um, I see that's relevant to the question of what to do about Beacon Wharf, but um, it really expands the scope of, uh, of our mandate. And um, I, I wonder if we should be taking that on without council direction. Ben, you want to take that one? So uh, Jen and I spoke about uh, some work we're having done on uh, planning for the refurbishment of the pier. And it, it, we think it could be a, a fairly um, minor add-on to the, the contract for the people who are doing that to maybe provide the, this committee with a little, little more information about uh, the life cycle cost of that fishing pier in terms of how frequently this maintenance work would need to be done. Maybe even something as far as um, 
estimated remaining life, that kind of thing, but uh, nothing beyond that. My thought would be you might want to make give that report to Committee of the Whole, and if Committee of the Whole wants to make it uh, part of this committee's mandate to uh, to look at um, whether we should have two peers, then you know we've we've been directed. But uh, I think council really needs to know what the life cycle costs are, rather than this committee. Jim, um, I mean, if that's uh, if that's something we want to do, that's something we can definitely we can take it off for now, and then uh, we can bring that uh, information to committee of the whole at a later date, um, and then if they direct it to come back to us and we can do that. They could be one of the options of recommendation to the, on the committee report if that seems reasonable. Okay. Jen, I have a question which is, and maybe this is educating me and I don't know if Scott, maybe you've got similar thoughts, but when you, when you put down something like, again, back to the thing about the, the fish market, and you've got determine how we will move ahead with cons consultation around this and you've put down January. What do you actually, what, what are you hoping to actually do by January? Or one of you guys could. Just talk a little bit about uh, how we're gonna consult on it. So um, hopefully by that time, we'll have narrowed things down a little bit. We'll know what is and is not feasible on the options we're going to be uh, putting out to the public. And uh, once we're at that stage, maybe just give some consideration to how we're going to deal with the fish market ask aspect as part of the consultation. OK. So when you say recommend removal and seek consent or propose options with them of the building, it's basically what you're really driving at is the methodology well, or like what you would go and consult the public on. Yeah, you know, I think the decision to be made at some point before consultation is whether we're going to go and consult on a recommendation that it be removed and see how people feel. Um, or do we instead provide option A with that or op an option B without and let them choose? So really, are we making a, a preferred recommendation and asking how people feel, or are we still giving people a choice and saying, which one would you prefer? That's all I mean by that. Because there's a big underlying element to this thing, which is, as we look at these options and for instance, the things that we just set up today, like the, the issues of height, um, could we, could we keep something to keep a structure, even with a floating structure off offshore? I guess what you're partly thinking then is that what, as we narrow in on how feasible it is to do this at all, each of those different options we've got, if some of them don't preclude or either do or don't preclude keeping the building, then that might inform how you actually want to consult though, right? To the public. Makes sense. Yeah, I, that, that's exactly uh, it. And, you know, to be honest with you, I know there's a lot of work and uh, consideration and consultation to happen. But after our last committee meeting, I personally went away with the, uh, with the really strong impression that the only truly viable and cost effective option that we're going to end up with is a floating structure. So it's mm -hmm. possible that if we over the next few months, I'll reach that same conclusion. We go out to consultation with just that recommendation and see how people feel about it. So that's right. just to share my thought process on that. And I guess uh, at this point in time, we're all trying to keep an open mind and as we look at these and, re and narrow them down, but obviously certain things are, you know, jump out at you, right? I guess is what you're saying. We just don't want to presuppose an outcome too early obviously, but uh, but at some point in time, that's what, we're, that's what we have to gravitate to. And I guess each of these different little um, assessments we're making are trying to give us a good documentation trail, if nothing else, of how we got there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, 
we could end up with one recommendation that we take out to the public and say, here's how we got there. Yeah. Tell us what you think. Exactly. Make things really, really easy at the end of the day. Just there's a lot of work that has to go into that. And, yeah. uh, you know, we're taking on a lot of um, assumptions if we do that. Right. Scott, you're actually you're, you're linked in. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, maybe I'll say a few words very quickly before my internet collapses. <laughs> um, one thing I, I would recommend that we consider for the future is that I found today's presentation by Mike uh, very informative. The previous presentation by SNC and John in particular was very insightful with his presentations. And um, they have, uh, when, when we get experts who have considered our issues presenting to us, I, I find we're able to move directly to key issues. And um, whereas as a committee, we kind of are all somewhat gentle and easy, easy going. And that, that last statement about the floating dock as an, as an opinion, uh, you know, formed from our last meeting, um, well, we're all forming different opinions, et cetera. And I, I think that the value of the consultant sort of basically just giving us the goods, just like uh, Peter said, uh, structures are not viable on the floating dock. Put it in writing. It doesn't need to be a big, long thing. It's in writing. It's done. Uh, and then we move to the other considerations, and, and they're, they're so useful. So, um, Jen and, and Rob, are we going to have another... Uh, presentation from SNC in the next meeting, or when when are we another chance to really have those engineers, uh, you know, ask them the difficult questions and get their guidance. You want to go ahead, Jen? Sure, I can. Uh, I'll, I'll follow up with SNC on their progress after this meeting. I'm not sure. Um, like, I'm assuming we'll probably want to get their report and have some time to review it and then have them. But maybe if their report's available by the end of November, they could come in and present to us at that early December meeting, um, just as a, a run through of, of the information that they've uh, come up with. And I guess we're hoping for a date on the next meeting actually with them, as well as I guess we were, we haven't heard anything different than maybe they're trying to wrap up that study they're doing by the end of November, as I recall. So by the December meeting, which we have to establish coming up here, um, you know, maybe we do have a presentation, Scott, as well as the as well as that interim meeting with them in the in the meantime as well. I think that would be great, but I don't yeah. want to. You know, it's committee got. To... Yeah, Randy. Uh, I um, I don't I'm I'm going to be quick on this one. I won't belabor it, but uh, yeah, I think uh, this. Quite frankly, I think the sooner that uh, we can get a clear perspective from the engineers on the uh, on the viability of structures on the uh, the on a on a on a wharf a floating wharf, the better. I think that um, you know we can spend a lot of time talking about how we're going to engage the community on, you know, heritage value associated with the, uh, the fish market building, et cetera. If it's not viable, it's not viable. And I think what's, what's more important is that we get ahead of it. And, uh, and we, um, if we're moving forward with an option, we make that very clear and be very transparent and clear to the community that this particular option there will be no structures, and uh, and that includes uh, that includes the, uh, the the fish market building, and these are the reasons why. And we make that uh, we make that abundantly clear. And maybe then, what are the alternative options that uh, might be there to reflect the heritage value associated with uh, with that building in another way that doesn't involve an actual building on the uh, on it? But uh, you know, just from my experience with respect to, and you saw the image when. Uh, when Mike said, here's a flashback from the past and you saw the band shell down on uh, Beacon Park. And, and um, I was directly involved with the community engagement about what to do with that band shell and what to replace it with, et cetera. And you know, the community was just so, so strong on, on retaining something that it had, you know, honestly, it was, it was a pretty, it was a pretty band shell. It had no heritage value whatsoever. It was, a, it was built from a kit and, and, uh, and, uh, 
um, and that was it, right? There was no historical um, value associated with that particular structure. So I think the move, the, the quicker we can get to the point about um, the viability of structures and then get that out to the community and whether that's in a town talk, uh, a dedicated town talk piece or whatever. But uh, I think I think it's important that we uh, we move forward on that, on that. Right. I guess, you know, in general, if I jump in, the, the approach that we're trying to really work towards then is, is with, the, for instance, if we get the, on the floating structure, if we get the memo that says you can't have a structure on it, if it's confirmed from, you know, if we can confirm it maybe through drawing sketches, whatever it is, that there's no viable way to keep a structure like that on the shore side with a floating structure off from it then you know that wipes out a number of options as well and then this height review helps to eliminate or confirm the viability of some of the other options based on what snc already did out of all that i'm personally hoping that in the next few months we're going to narrow in with a good documentation path on how we actually get to something out of that being the most viable looking option to present and go to the public with, you know, with whatever methodology you want to use, obviously. But that makes sense. That's sort of the process that we're, we're working towards here. We, feel, we know that the, the giant issues are structures versus no structures, the height and all the view impact that goes with that, and obviously the cost that's kind of driving all that. And then on a floating structure, if there's no if a floating pontoon structure like this one, if you can't put permanent structures on it and you can't put any on shore, all of those things, then, then of course you also get to, well, what's the reason for putting that out there is it because you want the marina functions that go with it. So we have all of those things are what we're, we're teasing out over the next few months. Kind of the process, Jen. Um, just before uh, we run out of time here, I just wanted to confirm with the, the voting committee members if we're taking the scope of the Bevan Fishing Pier off of the action plan. Yes, I'm happy. Yeah. Yes, let's take it off. Okay, I know we're almost out of time. So um, unless there's anything else really burning, um, the next meeting, which if we stuck to the idea of the first Wednesday each month would have been December 3rd. I understand, Andrew, you've got a conflict, right? I'm not sure when, do we want to try to set a different date? I don't need to be at every meeting, but if you would like me to be there, then the following week would work for me. Be clarify the third is a Thursday. I is think it? we we had initially booked the second, and that's what I have in my calendar. But uh, this states the third. You're uh, right. It should be the second. That's the date I can't be there. So the third I could, or Wednesday the ninth, I could be there. What well, does this, everyone uh, prefer yeah, to be? A the week third later? works for me. I don't know if it doesn't work for anybody. It works for me. I can anybody not do the, the third? third. Sorry? I can't, no. Allison, you can't do the third? No, no. Okay. but could do the following week, but I would get caught up by other staff members here if I'm not available. What would be the preference then to go with December 3rd, but we'd be missing or could everybody make the ninth, which is the following Wednesday then, right? I can't make the ninth. Okay. Um, maybe we should go with the third then? Sorry, I don't, I can't make the third either. Oh. But again, if- uh, Let's stick with the second then. We all have it in our calendars anyways. So let's just go with the second folks. December 2nd. Okay, we'll stick with the, is, the, is that fine for everybody? Scott, that worked for you? Scott's frozen. <laughs> Nodding, yes. Okay. So the December 2nd, because at least that way, the, if the five committee members can all be there, then December 2nd, it's obviously, you know, we need to make sure we got the quorum at the very least. So we'll stick with the second. Sorry, I also will make sure you get caught. You can watch or Andrew. The video. Okay, um, anything else before we adjourn from anybody? Otherwise, um, anything else? Move adjournment. Move to adjourn, yes. Seconded. Second. Second. Seconded. Thirded by Scott. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, Enjoy, enjoy the month of November. It's raining again outside. Thanks, Rob. Take care, you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Rob. Bye now.